Luke chapter 9. That's where we left off last week. We covered the first half of Luke chapter 9. And again, the theme of this chapter is somewhat uh, the calling and the equipping. Last, in our last lesson, the first half of Luke, uh, we looked at that. The, the disciples, the twelve of them, the twelve disciples were... They were sent out. They were sent out to preach the gospel and to heal the sick. But they wasn't just left, hey, you go and take care of it. And you, it's all on you. It wasn't like that. Jesus made sure that he give them power and authority over all the demons and to cure the diseases. Jesus made sure he equipped them for the task. At hand. And he does us the very same way. He doesn't just leave us on our own to take care of business. He is there with us. He has equipped us just as well. Now we know that the disciples returned and they were excited. They were excited that they went out and some things happened. Now next week we'll see that something didn't actually happen in one case. There was somebody that they couldn't take care of. But uh, but they went out and they come back and so they were excited and nonetheless they were give out too. They were probably tired because those of you that's been in ministry and uh, you know served before in this capacity, you know that it gives you out. At times you get tired. But not only did Jesus equip them to be able to deal with that calling, to go out and to preach and to, to cast out the demons and to cure diseases, but he also prepared a resting place for them. Jesus, when he calls and he equips, he also gives a place for rest. And the scripture had told us that he, had, uh, that he took them aside privately to a des desert, deserted place. And so Jesus does that with us just as well. He makes sure that he refreshes us and that's always important as you serve the lord that you do have that time of refreshing that you have that time that private time with the lord but then right back to business as they moved on with the five thousand the feeding of the five thousand jesus did and the disciples also got to play a part in this so amazing the part that they played right not a hard part jesus took care of all the hard work jesus blessed he broke and he gave the food to the disciples and then all they had to do is take it from the hands of the master and hand it out to the multitudes that's the part we should desire to play right that's really easy it's kind of like whoo not much burden on us right because he you know there's a light burden when we yoke up with jesus he was steering he was guiding he was doing the work and then he would simply hand it to the disciples and they would hand it out matthew chapter 10 verses 8 verse 8 the second half of verse 8 it speaks of the same account, uh, Matthew 10 does it around verse 8. But verse 8, portion B of it, the second half, it says, Freely you have received, freely give. And that's exactly what the disciples were doing. They were freely receiving from Jesus and just freely giving. The more they would give, you can imagine the more it was coming. And they were able to serve. And that's, that's awesome. It's powerful to be able to be used in this way. Now we move on uh, last week. We had moved on to Peter's confession. He confessed who Jesus was. Not often did Peter say things right, but this time he nailed it. If you remember, Jesus had asked, though, first he said, who do the crowd say that I am? Now people have a lot of different ideas of who Jesus is. In this world today, they have a lot of different ideas of who Jesus is. Even the church, sad to say, it can be very different ideas. But then the true question, the main question Jesus come with was, who do you say that I am? And that's the question that we all have to address at some point in our life. Who do we say Jesus is? Peter answered by revolutionary, uh, by revelation rather from the Lord. And he answered the Christ of God. Jesus was the Messiah, the one to come. Now, Jesus didn't come quite like they expected, did he? And he didn't set up kingdom here on this earth at this time quite like many of them may have expected. But then Jesus goes on to tell exactly what the Messiah had come to do. Jesus had remind, he reminded them that, the, that he had come to suffer, to be rejected, and to be killed. And then he didn't stop there. He moved on with one more portion of that, to be raised on the third day. And then he goes on to tell what they were to do. And likewise, what we are to do. And it was to deny ourselves, take up our cross, not just one time, but daily, but daily in there to take up our cross daily and to follow him. 
Now, this taking up our cross daily, can you think of, we think about it, we see the crosses people have around their neck. You know, we look at it as a real pleasing thing, and it certainly is because of what he did on the cross for us. But can you think of if we took up our electric chair daily? Or maybe we took up the hangman noose daily. This cross was a sense of torture and of death. And that's what we're to do. We're to give our life daily. Take up the firing squad daily. You can imagine. I mean, it's not necessarily a glorious thing at all in the way that it sounds. But it truly leads to a glorious thing. It leads to eternity. Eternal fellowship with the Lord God. By us laying our lives down for Him daily. And then we closed in, uh, with verse 27 in our last lesson. Uh, through the first half of chapter 9. And so that's exactly where we'll pick up tonight in verse 27 because it ties that taking up the cross daily into the next thing Jesus wanted them to see. So verse 27 of Luke chapter 9. Again, the theme stays the same throughout this chapter, the calling and the equipping. And he says, But I tell you the truth, there will there be some standing here which shall not taste death Till they see the kingdom of God. Now there's been much thought on this scripture. What exactly that it means. But the easiest way to tell is just read the next few verses. Right? The three of the disciples will get to witness Jesus in his glory. They'll get to witness him in such an amazing state. Now you can imagine this was certainly in, very encouraging. Because he had just said, okay, you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. So thinking of the Delta self, but now he shows that he's not uh, a Jesus that was just going to go die, but there was a glory that follows. He's the Christ. He is the living God. So it was something that was certainly encouraged after thinking of this Delta self. Now, verse 28 says, And it came to pass about in eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James, and he went up into a mountain to pray. And he prayed. The fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. Now, both Matthew and Mark also give this account, and they use the term in their accounts, he was transfigured. Jesus was transfigured. The Greek word here is metamorpho. That's the word, you know, metamorphosis. The, the, as a caterpillar builds his cocoon, and he goes in, and he, he changes. So that's the same word. So Jesus here... He changed. He was transformed. The meaning also is another form to transform, to transfigure. So Christ's appearance was changed and, and was that of divine brightness. Now this light that shone in Jesus, it wasn't like if he was standing on a stage and a spotlight shining on him or a pretty little halo around his head, but it was like a light shining outside, from inside to the outside rather with Jesus. One commentator makes the comment here that this was such a miracle, but the miracle truly is not that this took place here, this one event, but that Jesus walked on this earth as long as he did, and this wasn't a regular thing. For him to be able to maintain this glory in the flesh, in, in his uh, perfect man as we're studying in Luke, for him to be able to just maintain that divine glory is really the miracle that he was able to hold it back. Now, not only was it an amazing sight for these three disciples to be able to witness, but Peter, John, and James, they also witnessed two others there. Two other characters from the Old Testament they saw there standing and talking with Jesus. And behold, verse 30, there talked with him two men which were Moses and Elijah. Now, the King James says Elias, which says to still Elijah in the Old Testament, who appeared in glory and spake, of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Moses and Elijah was just taking a time to talk to Jesus. Now again, Jesus may have needed this encouragement as well to know that there was something better to come because he knew that the cross was before him. And it tells us here in Luke, Luke describes what they're talking about. We don't see that in the other two, in uh, Matthew and Mark, but Luke says that they spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. So Moses and Elijah talked to Jesus about the crucifixion, about the road that lie ahead of them. Verse 32, But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. 
And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass as they departed from him, Peter said, now I underlined Peter said, because Peter said can often mean pretty bad things, right? We've seen it meant something good when he spoke of what the Lord revealed to him about who Christ was. But here again, we will see Peter open his mouth and insert foot. So he said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said. Again, as common with Peter, he opened his mouth and he said something that he really had no business saying. Mark tells us that Peter said it because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. Peter just was looking for something to say. You know, so often if we're not real sure of what to say and it would just feel awkward, sometimes just try not to say nothing. Sometimes it works best, just don't say a word and see what God does with that. It's powerful sometimes when you just invite silence. Silence can be awkward to people, but when it's kind of intended and you just let it have its place in a, in a service or whatever it may be, it can be very powerful. Often the Lord speaks to us in them times, does He? If we too busy saying something, we close our ears up and we don't hear maybe what God's wanting to speak to our heart. So quite often, just be quiet. Just enjoy the silence and enjoy Him speaking. Especially, again, if we don't know what to say, it's certainly better to be quiet. Now again, Peter, he, he opened his mouth and he stuck his foot in it. And here it seems to be that he was making a making all three equal. Notice he said, let's make a tabernacle for Jesus, for Moses, for Elijah. But these three aren't equal. In no way are they equal. They had three different purposes, but we know Jesus is far above the, the, all other purposes. And now a voice came from heaven, or it came out of a cloud basically here in verse 34, while Peter, while he thus spake, while his mouth was still open and him speaking the words, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone. And they kept it close and no man, and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. Now can you imagine this cloud seemed to just it almost pass by them. As they enter into the cloud, they see the three there with Jesus. As they, the cloud passes through and tells Peter to be quiet. Uh, it, the cloud goes on by and now it's Jesus, the one and the only, right? Jesus, the one that we should put all our hope in. Now, we know that Moses, he represented, he brought the law. And Elijah, the prophets, we know there's the law and the prophets. But the scripture tells us that grace and truth come through Jesus. Again, the perfect one. And there's none any greater. Verse 37. And it came to pass on the next day. When they were come down from the hill, much people met him. And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. And lo, a spirit taketh him. And he suddenly crieth out, and it teareth him, that he foameth again, and bruising him hardly departeth from him. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. We're actually seeing that tonight. I might have said in the next chapter, it's here. There we're going to see that the disciples, they come back joyful that they had been able to deal with these evil spirits and, uh, and heal the sick. But they may not have told Jesus about this incident here. But it comes to the front, to the forefront here, though, in chapter 9. Now, remembering Jairus in the last chapter, he had a 12-year-old girl. And the Scripture told us that this was his only daughter and he comes seeking Jesus to heal his only little girl something about that's just probably special to parents with the only child you know I mean when you have two or three of them you got love to just kind of share around don't you but when it's that one there seems to be something special not to take anything away if you have more by any means I couldn't do that could I and you know we won't let my kids hear this you know they might think well does he just want one which one of us is it but again we see often that those that just had one is they they really come seeking Jesus. And we notice that here. That this man come. This was his only son. And he come crying out to Jesus. Come and asking him to help him. Notice the things that the spirit. That these demonic, this 
demonic spirit was doing in this young boy or young man. He would cry out. It would tear him. Or uh, another translation is it would convulse him. It would cause him to foam at the mouth. And it would even bruise him. Now we may would uh, call this today an epileptic seizure. That may would be the medical term. If you was to see a child doing this nowadays. Or, well, you know, he's having a seizure. But Jesus knew that this is it here. And this doesn't mean that all instances. I believe there are certainly times like these that maybe it's strictly uh, a physical issue that needs to be treated with medicine, that tr- needs to be treated in certain ways. But Jesus knew here with this child, it went far deeper than just a physical ailment. It was a spiritual issue. And I believe, again, as I said, that there are times to treat things maybe medically we should still always pray for them. We should never forget that the warfare that we in is not carnal, but it's mighty to God to pull them down of strongholds. We're in a spiritual battle and we should never lose focus with that. But again, in here, Jesus certainly brings that to the forefront. It was not just a physical case. It went, it went much deeper. Now this man had come seeking help from the disciples. He had come and asked them to heal to cast out this devil from his son. But they couldn't do it. In verse 41, it says, And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. And as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. Now, let's not be too critical on the disciples because they couldn't cast this devil out. What we really need to do here is look and say, okay, what, what did they learn? Because often we may find ourselves in similar situations. Maybe we didn't quite get it done like we should have got it done. Or uh, maybe we seem to not have much power in the situation. Or, Lord, uh, did my prayers even reach you? You know, at times we probably all have asked that. God, did you even hear my prayers? But, but we can always look and say, well, what did we learn in the situations that we went through? What did the disciples learn here? I believe that they certainly learned that they must always depend on Jesus. Not that they wouldn't, that Jesus called them out to some degree on their uh, uh, on a lack of faith here. That they may learn that they couldn't just get into a set pattern and do things with the A, B, C approach that they had to be open to do things a little bit differently. You see, Matthew 17, verses 19 through 21, it tells us that, of this account, it says, Then came the disciples to Jesus uh, apart and said, this was after the instant, and they, they said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind, notice this, this kind goeth out, but by prayer and fasting. Maybe the disciples hadn't been praying and fasting the way they needed to. They needed to step outside of just their ABC, how they were doing the healings and the casting out devils and maybe take this one a little more serious and pray and fast. Now one commentator says this. He says, speaking of the disciples, they were confounded at their want of success, but not their want of faith, which was the cause of their miscarriage. You see, they probably wondered, why couldn't we do it? Why wasn't we successful in this, Jesus? But it was really just a lack of faith. It was unbelief and to do things somewhat different. To step outside the norm. Verse 43. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But while they wondered every one at all things which Jesus did. He said unto his disciples. Let these sayings sink down into your ears. For the son of man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But they understood this not this saying. And it was hid from them that they perceive it not. And they feared to ask him of that saying. Now all were amazed at Jesus' mighty power. At the power of God working, if you will, through Jesus. Jesus being God in the flesh. We know Jesus the perfect man. He amazed many 
in the things that he done and the way that he healed and loved and fed and took care of the people. He was an amazing, perfect man. But this perfect man, God in the flesh, had other plans. Had other plans. And again, it was hard for the disciples to understand it. Here they didn't even they didn't even ask. They feared to ask him of the same. They just let, left it alone at this point. We know other times they certainly said things. Other times they said, far be it. You know, you shouldn't have to die. And, and Jesus even had to rebuke Peter at one point with this. And he said, get behind me, Satan. But here, Jesus. And that's what he would have to do. He would have to go to the cross. We see the ultimate goal is that. And it's for us to be delivered. You see, because we too, this sin that we live in is just like that demon that possessed that young man and convulsed him. And he had no control over it without Jesus and what he had done for us. Sin takes place in our life the very same way. We have no control. But that was the main goal is, is for us to be delivered. The Son of Man would have to be delivered unto the hands of men as Jesus told him here. He would have to go to the cross and pay the price in order for us to be set free. In order for us to have that freedom in Him. As you've probably heard it said, not freedom to sin, but we now have freedom from sin because of what Jesus has done. Now, it's about like man to all of a sudden think, here as Jesus is speaking of the humility that He's fixing to go through with the going to the cross, a very humbling death, uh, and for man, it's so like man to think, well, who's going to be the greatest? And that's what we see next. Now we see that's what's on their mind. It says, then there arose a reasoning among them, in verse 46, which of them should be greatest? And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, he took a child and he set him by him and said unto them, whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. So this was the hearts of the disciples. Hearing their master speak of going to the cross, and even already in this chapter, we've seen where he tells them to deny yourself and take up the cross. But here they're saying, who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be high? And now we look at the disciples and we say, we may not be far from that either, right? Have we all maybe struggled with that? Well, are we greater than them? Don't we struggle sometimes comparing ourselves with other people? That's the issue. That's an issue of the flesh. But just like Jesus knew the disciples' heart, he, he knows our hearts too. He knows that we have struggles with that at times. And Mark 9 tells us that Jesus asked, he, the same account here, Jesus asked him, he said, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? You see, they apparently had talked about this. Who was the greatest as they were journeying? And Jesus says, what was this y'all was talking about? And it says, but they kept silent. wonder why. They knew not to open their mouth here. They knew that they were in wrong uh, thinking. For on the road they had disputed among themselves, who would be the greatest? Do we seek to be great or do we seek to serve? Again, we spoke often about how Jesus teaches us an upside down kingdom for us to actually be great it comes with us humbling ourselves with us serving others a little child was taken and set by Jesus this little child Matthew 18 Jesus said surely I say to you unless you are converted and become as little children you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven a little child is pretty helpless aren't they they can't do a whole lot for themselves. They need help. They need parents to teach them how to do things. They need parents to do things for them at times. They have to rely on others. And that's how we're to be. But I can do it all on my own. Have you ever heard the saying, well, I'm not going to take anything from anybody. I've always earned what I got. Well, that, that's good to a sense. I mean, we want to have a sense of pride where we, you know, we're hardworking and we try to take care of ourselves in that sense. But we should always know that we can't do it all alone. And especially this. What Jesus done for us on the cross, we couldn't have done it all. We couldn't have done it at all because we have sin in our lives. It took a blameless, a perfect man to pay the price for us. And it takes us looking to Him just as a child 
would look to a parent for that help, to, to rely on that parent. It takes us to depend on Jesus in the same way. Matthew 18, verse 4, it says, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, does this little child the same as greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Again, an upside down kingdom Jesus is teaching us. To be great requires humility. It requires this death to self. It requires us depending on Jesus because, again, we can't do it. Now, John, uh, the disciple here, he brings us to another topic. An interesting topic, I think it is. It's still a topic that we see the calling and the equipping in. Verse 49, John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Now there are many that may not follow the Lord and do things quite like we do it, right? I mean, as a the Methodist Protestant denomination, we have certain ways about us and that others don't follow the same suit. But are they doing the work of the Lord? Are they moving and doing things that God has called them to do? They may be doing some of it wrong in our mind. Maybe in their mind, we may be doing some of it wrong. But we should never let there be a dividing factor here as John was about to do. Notice John seemed to think that since they were not right with that group, right there with the disciples, that they shouldn't be doing it. But Jesus said, Forbid them not, for he that is not against us is for us. Jesus brings unity with different groups, doesn't he? Now Paul, the Apostle Paul, also dealt with this. But even when he deals with it, he's dealing with some that are preaching almost in a sense to get him to cause him hardship. Philippians 1 verses 15 through 18 tells us, and it's, this is the attitude that Paul had here it says, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. You can see what's good and what's not there, can't you? The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, Paul asked, notwithstanding either way, whether in pretense or in truth. Whether somebody's doing it almost as a wrong motive or in truth. Just as Paul was teaching, Christ is preached. That's what Paul says. He says, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Paul rejoiced even at some that seemed to be teaching Christ to get at him in some form or fashion. Isn't that interesting? Is that the same heart that we would take or we'd say, oh no, we're not going to have it that way. Can we be in unity? Can we, can we rejoice as Paul did? Do we get upset with other denominations in the way that they do things? Again, possibly we may look at the way they do things and some of them, some of them are wrong. Yeah, it's no doubt. But again, they may look the same at us. But can we rejoice that Christ is being preached. That's the main thing there. And it come to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Now we can only imagine what Jesus was going through here. He knows that he's headed to the cross. This is his last trip as he journeys in to Jerusalem. He knew what, knew what was before him and his face was set to go to Jerusalem. This is the love that he demonstrated for us. Even before the cross, he was demonstrating that love as, as he was steadfast, unmovable. He was, he was going. He had a mission and he was headed there. Now the Samaritans certainly noticed this. Uh, noticed that his face was hit towards uh, Jerusalem and so therefore they didn't receive them. Now there may be times in our lives that our face is set towards a certain purpose that God has for us. It could be offensive to others even. They may not receive us because we have a purpose and we know 
that this is what God wants us to do and maybe we're rejected. But we should still move in God's will. We should not have the attitude that we see that James and John has. Verse 54 says that when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Even, even the ones that rejected Jesus. He come to save. We rejected Jesus at one time. Romans 5 verse 8 tells us, But God commandeth His love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What love is that? How great of love. Jesus, while we hated Him, while we were yet sinners, He loved us. This is a God that we should certainly want to follow and serve, isn't it? Just the fact of what He's done for us and how much He loves us is what should bring us to wanting to worship Him. Now, as we closed the first half of chapter 9 last week, we saw Jesus speaking of taking up the cross and following Him, denying yourself and following the Lord. We will see that the second half tonight, the second half, the end of chapter 9 will close in a like manner. Now, we certainly know that salvation is a free gift. We can't work there. We can't earn salvation. It's free and it's provided by the sacrifice that Jesus made. Yet to walk in this wonderful work of salvation, to to move in what God has purposed for our lives, it requires us to lay down our lives. We have to give our will up in order to do His will. Again, this is not saying that we work unto salvation, but rather salvation does a work in us. Verse 57 says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee wherever, wheresoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of air have nests. But the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. Again, there's a cost to follow Jesus. There may be times that we're not comfortable. He didn't even have a place to lay his head, he was saying, because he was on the move. Jesus was busy. He had the mission in front of him that he was busy with. So we see that at times, in following Jesus, it will affect us physically. And he said to, unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. The cost will be that we have to put Jesus first. Even over family, Jesus comes above all things. Again, there wasn't three tabernacles to be set up, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Jesus is first and foremost above all things. What we see here that we must follow Him mentally, physically and mentally. And then verse 61 through 62, closing up. And another also said, Lord, I will follow Thee. But let me first go bid them farewell which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put, put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Again, the cost of following Jesus. It requires all of us. Jesus wants everything that we have. It takes dedication. Put your hand to the plow and continue to move forward. We must follow Jesus spiritually. We see the three there. Physically, mentally, and spiritually. Now in this chapter, closing chapter 9. Chapter 9 has taught us what it looks like to be called by God. And that He doesn't just leave us with a calling, but He equips us. The calling to follow Christ certainly, certainly requires us to take up the cross and to follow Him. It requires death to self. It is a calling that requires everything that we have, everything that we encompass. It requires all of us. We can't just give God parts of our life and try to hold back the other parts for our pleasure and entertainment. We're to give God all of us. It's a calling that requires the whole body, mind, and spirit. But again, He equips us. He gives us the strength to be able to operate in this call that He's called us to. And we'll close with this last verse. Matthew 22, verse 37 said, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart 
And with all thy soul and with all thy mind, let us pray. Father, we do come before you and we thank you, God. And we're humbled before you because, God, we know it's times, Lord, that we don't want to take up the cross. It's times, Lord, that we'd rather take up our will and do our own thing because it's such, uh, maybe such pleasure in it. It's, it's easier possibly than laying our lives down and doing your will. But, Father, we ask that you continue to call us to your purpose. That you continue to move us and give us strength, Lord God, in your calling, in your will, Lord God. Let us pray like Jesus, Father, and say, nevertheless, not our will, but thy will be done, Father. And so, Father, we pray that as we leave uh, the safety and the comfort of this church building, Lord God, as we leave tonight, go into this world tomorrow, Lord God, that, that we'll move as you call us. That we'll be bold. Lord, and that you'll have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.